ecosystem invasion in Australia, helping wildlife, eco-friendliness on campus. Hello, welcome to Green Voices, a weekly program co-sponsored by the Ministry of Environmental Protection of China and Xinhua News Agency. I'm Nia Dayang in Beijing. Joining us today is Zhou Jing, the Associate Managing Editor of World Environment Magazine. Hello and welcome. Hello, Linda and dear audience. Our first topic today involves the invasion of ecosystems. As the world becomes ever more connected, trains, planes, ships, and more are moving from country to country for business and pleasure. What people may not realize is that plants, animals, bacteria, insects, and more are often hitching a ride along and end up creating chaos in the new environment they not call home. What's more, some people are purposely introducing some animals to new ecosystems to try and make money. Green Voices has more from Australia. With the startling announcement last week that Australia's public enemy number one, the cane toad, has been discovered in large numbers around Sydney, biosecurity is suddenly on the minds of Australians everywhere. These massive feral amphibians have become a major invasive threat to Australian biodiversity since their introduction in North Queensland from South America in 1935. Originally introduced to Australia to try and control beetles that were destroying Queensland's lucrative cane fields, Australia's top cane toad expert, Professor Rick Shrine of the University of Sydney, says the result has been nothing short of a national disaster. The big problem with toads is that we have no native species of toads in Australia, and toads have poisons to defend themselves that are different from the poisons that Australian frogs have got. So if an Australian predator, like a marsupial or a lizard or a snake, seizes a toad trying to eat it, it will be killed by the poisons of the toad. They come primarily by ship, either on the hull of the ships or in the ballast water, once the ballast water is empty. And they range from seaweeds to worms to sea squirts to fish, um, representatives of most of the major kinds of marine organisms that we see in the world's oceans. Because of Australia's unique biodiversity, experts are only now beginning to understand the impact of introduced species. Only time will tell whether the damage is irreversible. So far, in order to strengthen eco-safety, Australian Customs has mapped out more and more stricter measurements. Well, Ms. Joe, this kind of ecosystem invasion is nothing new, and it seems that there is nothing we can do to stop it. No, I don't agree. Uh, briefly, when we say a uh, biological invasion, it means when a, a new kind of creature when moves to a new environment, it will spread rapidly and widely. But I should mention that uh, biological invasion or invasive species is quite different from the common foreign creatures, such as at the beginning of the 20th century, the United States introduced the soybean from China but it does not uh, uh, give any bad uh, uh, damage to the environment. And the same with China. In Han Dynasty, Mr. Zhang Qian went to Western countries. When he came back, he brought a lot of crops back at home, such as uh, grape, carrots. And for the recent centuries, we also in introduced many uh, crops like uh, corn, uh, uh, peanuts and potatoes. So these are common foreign creatures. But one thing I should also point is that when a foreign creature moved to a new uh, settlement, at the beginning it does not damage the environment. After a while, when the climate and environmental conditions changed, they will gradually become invasive species. It's a, also a very important point I should point. Well, it seems that this kind of biological invasion is a very serious problem. It is. It is all over the world and also in China. So I can tell you two another interesting stories. One is uh, there is a kind of a flower called a king flower. So from this name, you can know the rough idea. Uh, it has a very beautiful clothes on it. Why I say this? because it has a bright yellow flowers. So usually people take it as a ranging flower. 
Uh, more than 70 years ago, China introduced this uh, flower back in, in China, and it was taken as a ranging flower. But gradually, it became wild seeds. Why I say this? Because this kind of plant is a perennial plant. It has a strong roots, and it, it grows very rapidly. Sometimes it will take a, a lot of space from other creatures, such as it occupies sunlight and menu from the other creatures. So gradually, this kind of plant just became the only one left in the nearby environment. Another story is about a very interesting historical incident. Uh, in 1520, when Spanish people invaded Mexico, at that time, a general brought less than 600 soldiers to Mexico, but in the end, they conquered more than millions of soldiers. Why? Later on in, 19, sorry, in 20th century, there is a very famous historian uh, came from uh, United States. He wrote a book. In this book, he tells us a very strong, influ uh, very strong conclusion that why the Spanish debating, sorry, uh, beating the Mexico just because of a very small virus called a smallpox virus. You know this kind of uh, microorganism? This is a very tiny virus. So we can call it just a, a biological weapon in this way. Thank you, Ms. Zhou. Just as Ms. Zhou said, many invasive species have caused a great threat to local ecosystems. The reason? The biological invasions break the very sensitive balance of the system, which has taken centuries to adapt. This plant is called Eupatorium adnophorum. It was an exotic species from Mexico, and now we can find it all over China's Yunnan province. This plant can grow quickly and occupy deserted mountains, grasslands, and farms within a very short period of time. So it is nicknamed as botanical cancer. The E. etnophorum is a poisonous plant. It can kill all the original plants in an area and threaten the biological diversity. Its seeds can fly about easily in the air and start to grow shortly after they land. The plant also causes many animal diseases that can affect horses, cows, and sheep. It has already spread over provinces in southwestern China and caused big problems. Now local governments are trying to stop the plant from invading more areas. Both manual work and chemical methods have been employed to reduce the damage. Water hyacinth, first introduced to China as panage, came from the Amazon region in South America. The water plant has now made a biological invasion across China. Large-scale water hyacinth floated on the reservoir at the Shuiko Hydropower Station in Fuzhou, capital of southeast China's Fujian province. Sometimes the water covered with the water hyacinth is hardly visible. Water hyacinth can also accumulate heavy metal elements. It would come as a big threat to other water plants when it dies and sinks to the riverbed. If used properly, Liu says, hyacinth can become valuable to the ecosystem as it can purify water. Uh 
Ms. Zhou, can you give us some suggestions on how to prevent this kind of biological invasion or is there any kind of measures we can do to stop if this has already happened? Sure, we can. For the all over the world, uh, we have already done something on this. Uh, for example, uh, in 1992, there was a very famous uh, UN conference on environmental and development held in Brazil. Uh, at that uh, uh, conference, many, many, many countries signed an uh, international convention on biological diversity. And this is a very strong uh, tool for prevention, I think. And we also have uh, uh, we also have another kind of uh, uh, legal tool. It calls uh, International Convention on the Law of the Sea, and also IUCN issued a list on the hundred most invasive species for all over the world. And in China, we have also done a lot of job uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture. That has set up a. Uh, National Cooperative Group on Prevention, and the members are coming from uh, Ministry of Environment, State uh, Quality in Inspection Administration, and the General Administration of Customs, and, and so on. And we also have a, a very useful uh, searching tool. Uh, they set up a, a database on the biological biological uh, species, and then we also have some early warning system, and then we also have set up uh, uh, capacity building on the evaluation and so on. The last but rather the least is the public awareness and uh, actions. So for ordinary people, when you go abroad or go other places of your country, you keep in mind, don't bring the invasive, uh, the, the biological uh, invasive species come back to your hometown or your family and especially don't plant them because it will damage your uh, nearby uh, environment. And uh, keep in mind that when you're coming back at home, you just clear up your luggage just in order not to bring the eggs or insects back at your home. And a very most important thing is that don't release the pets, your pets like a dog or animal or any turtle at will, I mean casually, because this will damage the environment, I mean the ecological system very badly because we have this kind of uh, uh, lessons in the past few years. Is there any way that we can take advantage of this kind of biological invasion if it has already happened? Sure. Just as uh, we saw in the pictures, uh, we, in the video, people in Fujian or Shanghai and other cities are very angry about a, a kind of a plant called uh, water hyoses because it spread very rapidly and widely. So for my, in my opinion, two, everything has two sides. One is a bad side and the other is uh, a good side. So for the water hyoses, Sometimes we can use it to make electricity through the, uh, through the fermentation. And people also can uh, make paper and furniture by using its material. And as uh, it can be made into fertilizer sometimes. And as it can absorb some elements such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and sometimes the metal elements like gold, silver, mercury, and pesticides. So people use it to uh, treat the waste water. And in addition, sometimes uh, the miners can use this to green tannins. Thank you for your perspective. You're watching Green Voices. We'll be right back. Wildlife smuggling is the third largest illegal trade in the world, only after drug and weapon smuggling, and generates 10 billion U.S. dollars of revenue each year. But sadly, for every 10 animals smuggled, nine will die because of injury or excessive anesthesia used to catch or transfer them. To try and help the animals, the Real Dirt General Zoo Foundation has been rehabilitating them and put them back in the original environment. Green Voices, more from Brazil. 
Brazil, the world's fifth largest country, is considered to have the greatest biodiversity of any country on the planet. However, the animal smuggling there is also astonishing, which accounts for approximately one tenth of the world's total, and leads to the endangerment of over 200 animal species, according to the Brazilian government. Statistics show that huge amounts of smuggled animals died in the capture and transportation process. In recent years, the Rio de Janeiro Zoo Foundation is curing animals tracked down during anti-smuggling campaigns and sending them back to the wild. Os que não apresentam condições, no geral, de de serem é, introduzidos nos seus seus ambientes naturais são encaminhados a zoológicos, criatórios, enfim, permanecem em cativeiro. Né? O, o a Rio Zoo recebe alguns animais. Né, mas principalmente no, no caso de animais com lesões, animais debilitados ou filhotes que não aguentariam esse transporte, né, não sobreviveriam a esse transporte. Brazil is one of the countries with a large number of bird species. 98 out of 111 endangered bird species live in the rainforest of Brazil. Among the smuggled animals, birds with euphonic twitter and brightly colored plumage are the most popular. Também tem aqueles casos de alguns passeriformes que cegam para ele fazer aquele canto mais choroso, mais triste, que tem algumas pessoas que também acabam querendo esse tipo de canto, né? Então vão, é, fazem esse tipo de maldade com os animais. Tá? Além de amarrar corda, imobilizar o animal, deixar ele preso praticamente a vida inteira com uma cordinha, uma corrente amarrada ao corpo que chega a ferir, causar lesões, fraturas, tudo isso neles, né? Certain species of toads in Brazil's rainforest were recently found to possess venom, much more effective than morphine, which again worsens the toad smuggling trade. According to the Universal Declaration of Animal Rights signed in London in 1977, every animal has the right to be respected. Man, like the animal species, cannot assume the right to exterminate other animals or to exploit them, thereby violating this right. He should use his conscience for the service of the animals. Every animal has the right to consideration, good treatment and the protection of man. Animal rights activists hope the conscience of mankind and legislation in various countries will help protect animals from being smuggled and allow more animals to live in the wild. Wildlife authorities in Kenya have found an innovative way to protect animals who lost their homes. They've initiated animal adoption, and as CNC found out, even some of the world's biggest stars have lent a helping hand. Due to increasing human activities, many wild animals in Kenya stray into unprotected areas. They either lose their group or herd, or they become orphans after their mothers die or are killed. The Kenya Wildlife Service adopts these lost animals. But it's found that at about 3,000 U.S. dollars a year to feed, clean and vaccinate each one, it can't keep up with the costs. It costs some money to rescue these animals in the wild and providing them a home. And remember, once they are here, it's very difficult for them to go back in the wild because they are not used to. So what we do as KWS is we keep them here for their entire life. For example, a lion can stay here for 40 years, yeah, and so to feed that animal for 40 years is very expensive. In November last year, the Jamaican sprinter Wusun Boat and the Kenyan Prime Minister Rayla Odinga adopted a cheetah cup and lion at the launch of a program to adopt stray animals. Since then, businesses and individuals have also come forward to help find homes for them. But the Kenya Wildlife Service says there are currently close to 100 animals still needing a place to live, and they're always on the lookout for people who can take an animal in. Animal smuggling and trade is a brutal business which continues out of greed. For example, the Real de Janeiro Zoo Foundation says a green-winged mohawk and blue macaw can easily sell for 60,000 U.S. dollars in America. So, Ms. Zhou, what do you think this kind of market has reflected? Uh, uh, in my opinion, I think the smuggling of wild animals totally should be forbidden. It's a very bad thing uh, for both animals and the human ourselves. Uh, like human beings, we have human rights. I think for the animals, they, they should have enjoyed their rights. So uh, in this regard, I think Western countries set an uh, example for the rest of the world. In 1977, London or Britain has uh, issued a 
very uh, serious uh, uh, convention or declaration. It's called a uh, World Declaration on Wild Animal. It's just for the world, a lot for England itself. And also in uh, all over the world, uh, we have many, many um, animal welfare organizations such as IFO, uh, WCS, and the PETA. And in China, we also have such a kind of organizations such as um, uh, wild animal aiding centers all over the country. But once I should point is that for animal especially wild animal adopting, I'm not quite agree with this idea because wild animals has its own home in the wild. They are not used to family conditions. So if you really take care of the animal, you should keep them in the wild. And I have a suggestion for those people who take care of animal. You can donate some amount of money to some professional organizations so they can take very good care of the animal instead of you keeping at your home. You just mentioned animal adoption. Well, actually, a, a lot of organizations are promoting this kind of idea. Do you think it is a good way to protect the wildlife by adoption? Well, adoption is not a very good way. But anyway, just like I said, you can donate some money or your care to some professional organization, not as, not as, as you do uh, as uh, adoption. Thank you very much, Ms. Zhou. Ecosystem invasions and animal smuggling are just two environmental issues making headlines this week. Green Voices has more. The water quality of a river in northeast China tested clear Thursday, a day after floods swept thousands of containers full of chemicals into the waterway. Tao De Qian, a spokesman for the Ministry of Environmental Protection, said the ministry has dispatched a work team to help deal with the emergency and stepped up monitoring of water quality along the Songhua River, which flows about 1,900 kilometers through the Heilongjiang and Jilin provinces. More than 7,000 chemical containers had been washed into the Songhua from Jilin city of Jilin province after rain-triggered floods hit a chemical plant. Government officials say only 3,000 containers were holding chemicals with about 170 kilograms each, and the other 4,000 were empty. Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection has released an environmental quality report for the first half of 2010. The report released on July 26 showed the overall environmental quality across the country remained stable, though in some places there is still room for improvement. The overall surface water quality in China has significantly improved, including in China's seven major rivers. Moreover, the report found that surface and underground water in the Yushu area was not badly affected by the earthquake in April. A study of 113 key cities has also found that air quality is generally good. China's first eco-friendly garden of giant salamander was set up recently and opened to the public in southeast China's Jiangxi province. Located in the Sanzhuang Lu National Forest Park, the Garden of Salamander takes up an area of 100,000 square meters with a total investment of 15 million yuan or about 7.5 million U.S. dollars. It integrates salamander protection with ecological tourism, cultural exchanges, and science research under the sponsorship of China's Ministry of Agriculture. The giant salamander, also called the baby fish because of its baby cry-like sound, is a species under special protection in China. Jing'an County of Jiangxi Province is known as the hometown of Chinese giant salamander. For years, elephants and people in Africa have struggled to live together. The elephants would often attack locals and even eat their crops. To stop this from happening, researchers began placing GPS trackers on the elephants to keep tabs on their location and movements. Knowing where the elephants are is essential to protect and manage their population and the safety of people. Since 1996, researchers have tagged more than 2,000 elephants in several of Africa's natural reserves, something locals are very grateful for. The tracking projects are taking place in Kenya and across Africa. 
themed as Join Hands to Protect Aquamarine Life, an aquamarine life protection project organized by Minister of Agriculture, PRC, and other related departments, started in China's capital city, Beijing, on July the 18th. This event attracted many children from around the country. More than 100 aquariums, parks, and other organizations are taking part in this project. During the month-long event, various activities will be staged, including text message competition, painting competition, and desi contest, to raise awareness about aquatic and marine life protection. New York City is a city of water, and on the July the 24th, the third City of Water Day Festival is just held in Governor Island in New York City and attracts thousands of visitors to come. New York Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance called for all lovers of water sports to get together in New York Governor's Island by boating water biking Saturday to celebrate the third New York City of Water Day Festival. Although the temperature was 36 degrees Celsius, visitors enjoyed all kinds of activities, including boating, fishing. Some kids also joined workshops to learn more about the marine environment. City of Water Day Festival volunteer David Holloran told CNC that the water is the essential element to all New Yorkers, and the goal of this festival is to bring people's attention to sea environment protection. Historically, New York has not cared a thing about its waterfront. And over the past 15 years or so, we've really started to place a lot more value on the water. People in Japan's coastal city of Yokohama are trying to help cool down the planet, literally. They held a water splashing ceremony on Friday to raise awareness about saving water. The ceremony took place at the Mazu Temple in a well-known tourist spot in the city's Chinatown. Young people, some dressed in traditional Chinese clothes, splashed recycled water along the main street of the town despite sizzling temperatures. Nearly 100 people took part in the event, which is aimed at raising awareness about saving water and fighting global warming. Going green is something we can all do. An example, the University of Shantou made a point to make its library an environmentally friendly one. Green Voices is more from China. In the library of Shantou University, books are tidily lined up on the shelves. But this library isn't only known for its collection of books, but also for the green concept it adopts. The entrance to the library is specially designed to allow more natural light to shine in, with a view to reducing electricity consumption. Designs of this kind can be found anywhere in the library. Crowned as the most beautiful university library in Asia, the Shantou University Library stands out not only with its design of a giant bookcase, but also as a perfect example for recycling and reusing water and land. These environmentally friendly designs also look appealing to the eye. Readers can also feel the green touches of the library when they borrow books. They can easily borrow or return a book with the help of the library's special computering system. There is a special recycling bookshelf that facilitates both the readers and the staff. A big horn named What is Missing is placed in the library yard. People can hear from it sounds of endangered animals. This is another design to remind people of saving our planet. Hopefully we will have more of this kind of green libraries in the near future. That's Green Voices for this week. Thank you for being here, Ms. Zhou, and thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.
Coming up, hotter northern hemisphere, colder southern hemisphere. The globe is frequently haunted by extreme weathers. UN launches the third climate change conference this year. Pet ownership summer camp in Canada. Hello, welcome to Green Voices, a weekly program co-sponsored by the Ministry of Environmental Protection of China and Xinhua News Agency. I'm Nia Dayangzhi in Beijing. Joining us today is Mr. Wang Yongguang, Chief Meteorologist for the National Center for Climate in China's Meteorological Administration. Mr. Wang, thank you for being with us. Good morning, everyone. Since the beginning of this summer, many countries in the North Hemisphere have always been haunted by heat waves. Green Voices takes you to these countries. The long, hot summer in Northern Hemisphere is becoming a major climate issue this year. Many cities in the United States have suffered from heat waves this summer. New York City is no exception. The average temperature of this July in New York was 82 degrees, which broke the city's record for the last 10 years. The long, hot summer in Northern Hemisphere is becoming a major climate issue this year. Many cities in the United States have suffered from heat waves this summer. Since the 4th of July weekend, New York City has been scorching hot. According to the latest statistics, the average temperature of this July in New York was 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which broke the city's record for the last 10 years. This summer is the hottest in Moscow for 130 years. The temperatures here have beaten records for several times uh, since July. And in some districts, the temperatures even reach as high as 39 uh, Celsius degrees. And the ongoing heat have triggered fires outside Moscow too. And for the last few days, the capital has been cloaked in smoke. And in Moscow, there are still strong smells from the, uh, of burning from the uh, fire. And some people are wearing masks in order to not, in order not to uh, inhale the polluted air. And in order to escape the heat, many people jumped into the fountains to get cold. And in Moscow, electric fans and air conditioners are running out of supply because of the heat. People stayed under the trees to escape from the hot wave in Alexander Garden near the Kremlin in Moscow. Visitors queued for ice cream and cool beverages. In Manasnaya Square, people simply jumped into the fountain. According to the meteorological expert, the hot wave in Moscow will continue for weeks, and this is going to be the hottest summer in the past 130 years. From the beginning of July, Ukraine's maximums have been between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius. In the capital city, Kiev, it has been as high as 35.3 degrees Celsius, the highest since 1881. To escape the heat, citizens flocked in the beach and river to enjoy a temporary cool time. Meanwhile, Ukrainians are proposed to follow anti-heat measures. Doctors urge children and the elderly to stay indoors. Russia and the U.S. are now the only countries in the northern hemisphere being hit hard by the high temperatures. July 10th and 11th was Germany's hottest weekend this year. France's summer temperatures are 10 degrees higher than last, and Finland has recorded its highest temperatures since 1935. We all know summer is supposed to be hot, but the high temperatures this year are very unusual. Mr. Wang, could you tell us if there is a reason or direct cause for this extreme heat this summer? Yeah, uh, the direct reason is that there are some high pressure or the uh, heat wave areas and uh, prevail the downward flow, dry and hot, and the sky is clear, the solar radiation is very strong, so and the temperature on the ground is increasing very fast. And uh, for the high pressure system, in the different latitude have the different name. Uh, it's called the subtropical high in the uh, low latitude and uh, continental high in the middle latitude and uh, blocking high in the high latitude. Uh, Mr. Wang, many experts say that they believe uh, this phenomenon called urban heat island effect is behind the temperatures. Could you please ex explain this concept to us? And do you think this is the cause for the extreme weather this year? Yes, the urban heat island is a phenomenon that the temperature in the cities is higher than that in the countryside around. And there are some reasons called the urban heat island. The first is the man-made constructions. We know there are many buildings and roads in the cities uh, made of the concrete and 
asphalt, and they absorb too much heat from the sun, so cause the temperature in the cities very high. The second, the man-made heat resources, the human activities in the cities all put too much heat uh, while using up the energy. The third is the greenhouse effect. Too much greenhouse gases is released to the air. In daytime, they absorb the heat from the sun, and in daytime, they prevent the uh, long wave radiation to the space. So the urban heat island is a important play an important role to the heat wave in the cities such as the New York and the Moscow. Thank you very much. While the Northern Hemisphere is suffering from heat, other countries in the southern half of our world are experiencing extreme cold and snow. Green Voices is more from Argentina and Peru. Situated in the Southern Hemisphere, the winter is always moderate and agreeable in Argentina. However, the temperature in its capital city, Buenos Aires, has swooped down to minus 1.5 degrees, which made the record low in nearly 10 years. How do I feel about this? This is terrible. It wasn't cold as that much, the last snow as it is now. Many were the coldest ever, but today is quite cold too. Because of the coldness, there are not many people on the streets, so that it affected the business of the stores and newsstands. Yes, it affected our sellings. People wouldn't like to shop anymore when in a such cold weather. That's even worse when it rains. Nobody is out for shopping. The temperature in most parts of Argentina hit the low record besides Buenos Aires. Many places are largely covered with snow. The Peruvian National Meteorological and Hydrological Service declared an amber alert, saying the freezing weather will last for 10 days. It is the seventh coldest nap of Peru this year. According to a meteorological expert, the coldest nap will cause radical climate changes to tropical forests in the north and the coastal areas in the center of Peru. Mr. Wang, as we all know, that global warming is making our world much more warmer than before. But why our winter is not getting colder? Yeah, in the South America, there are some cold weather, and the major reason is that the cold air from the Antarctic breaks out from the Antarctic to the South America, leads to the uh, cold air strong and uh, enhance the cold weather in South America. And because of the global warming, the heat waves are getting uh, strong and uh, very frequently, and uh, the summer gets hot and hot. But for the chilliness in winter, uh, this, the intensity is very weak, and the uh, winter is not so cold. So do you think it's fair to say that the global warming effect is actually one of the factors that which has caused the extreme weather? Yeah, uh, the, the global warming has caused the heat waves, but uh, not the cold stream weather in the winter. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang. You're watching Green Voices. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Green Voices. Uh, Mr. Wang, in general, could you tell us which areas in the Northern Hemisphere usually see hot summer and which areas in the Southern Hemisphere usually see colder winters? Yeah, there, are, there is a desert zone in the Northern Hemisphere uh, from the Northern Africa to the west of the Indian Peninsula. And uh, in, the, in the summer, the temperature is very high in these regions. And in South Hemif Southern Hemisphere, uh, besides the Antarctic, there is a Andes climate zone in the west coast of the South America. In this area, bec because the uh, high altitude, and the temperature in this area were low in winter. Thank you for your introduction. 
The extreme weather has caused more than just inconveniences. Many are getting sick and even dying. Tens of thousands of Japanese were sent to hospitals because of heat stroke, and at least 16 Argentines froze to death. To keep people safe, many countries have developed ways to escape both the heat and the cold. Green Voices has more. It is becoming major for people in New York to avoid the summer heat. The city has opened over 600 cool shelters and swimming spots for the residents. Outdoor water dispensers are placed in squares and parks to offer drinking water. I think it's excellent. I think it's very needed.、Um, we're we're traveling. We've just come over from London for a short break to New York, and I think this is an excellent idea. And it's, it's as I said, it's、um, it's much needed because I mean we're going through a heat wave here, and、um, I think all the good citizens need to. Yeah, tank up on the water. It's really important for their health and well-being. To help homeless people and those who cannot afford air conditioners, major cities in the United States are offering free air-conditioned rooms. In Washington D.C., the local government also extended the opening hours of public swimming pools. Due to the strong polar cold and large-scale snow, the temperatures of most regions in Argentina have been below zero Celsius, which has greatly worsened the living conditions of drifters in the country. The Argentine government and charity institutions are helping a lot. Red Solidaria, a civilian organization, has been distributing food and clothing to drifters and the poor in Buenos Aires, capital of Argentina. Of course, I would like to stay home and sleep. I can take a hot bath and have a warm food. But it reminds me of those who cannot enjoy these things. I feel good to have them and offer them hot soup. For now, there are 20,000 homeless people in Argentina and 1,400 of them in Buenos Aires. Mr. Wang just says we see in our video. What do you think of the measures the government has launched to combat the extreme weather? The government can take some steps such as the heat, heat prevention constructions and the variations in the cities and、uh, economize energy and、uh, decrease emissions to slow down the global warming. And、uh, for the civilians. Some steps can be take. Firstly, the decreasing the unnecessary outgoing, especially in the afternoon. Second, um, when outgo outgoing, uh, we can take some uh cap or umbrella to prevent this uh sunshine, and uh, uh wear some white shirts. The third, don't face the Air conditioning of fanner directly. Thank you very much. Animals can also be victims of the extreme weather. In Paraguay, nearly 1,000 cattle have frozen to death, which is why extra precautions are in place around the world. Green voices more from China's Hangzhou Zoo. Animals in Hangzhou Zoo are finding ways to get through the 35-degree summer in the capital of East China's Zhejiang Province. Chen Chen, a panda from Southwest China's Sichuan Province, would not go outside anymore after an outdoor walk in the morning. Now, eating watermelons in an air-conditioned room is his favorite choice. We set the temperature at 21 degrees. For a day like this, the air conditioner will run for about 20 hours. The panda mainly eats bamboo leaves in summer, and sometimes we will give it watermelons. In the elephant park, two elephants are taking sun bath with mud on their bodies. The zookeepers give them cold showers and feed them with watermelons. A water spraying room was specially built for the sea polyromas, a monkey species from Africa. Once the temperature reaches 35 degrees, the pipe on the roof will start spraying water, cooling the room for a short time. Other monkeys living in the Monkey Mountains stay in the shade to avoid the heat. There are more than 2,000 animals of over 200 species living here. The zoo has bought nearly 150 kilograms of watermelons and set up a medical team in case of animal heat stroke. And Mr. Wang, this kind of natural disaster has happened many times in the history. So, what can we do before the disaster actually happens to prevent it from happening? Yeah, to prevent this accident, I think broadcast the、uh, warning. 
in time as the very important steps. The cold wave warning is divided into the four grid, the blue, the yellow, and orange, and red. The stock breeding can make a decision to defend the chilenese, and the government can meet an emergency. Thank you for your perspective. Recently, climate issue has become an international issue. More efforts have been devoted to the cause since last year's Copenhagen Climate Change Conference. As a prelude to the Cancun Climate Change Conference at the end of this year in Mexico, the third United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was held in Bonn, Germany. The third round of UN climate talks kicked off here on Monday. It continued to prepare the ground for the Air and Cancun Summit. Although a widely accepted treaty still seemed unlikely, negotiators and environmental organizations expected the board meeting could witness some progress in some substantial issues, including climate funds and capacity building. The third international climate change negotiation of 2010 kicked off Monday in Bonn, Germany. The executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change urged that every government should take the responsibility in tackling the problem of climate change. Developed countries should have more comprehensive emission reduction plan, including faster financial support, more strict emission regulation, and a more valid legal agreement. At the end of the second negotiation this year, a work group of UNFCC put forward a document with 22 pages, which was criticized by many developing countries as it represented mostly the intention of the developed countries. Therefore, the work group redid the document in July, and representatives from all over the world can present their ideas about this new version in the third negotiation. A total of 4,500 representatives from nearly 190 countries participated in the negotiation. The fourth one this year will be held in October in Tianjin, China. Mr. Wang, what do you think of the Cancun Climate Change Conference? This is a regular meeting of the two working groups, AWGLCA and AWGKP under IPCC. The meeting will take place several times each year uh, to reach some concurrence. I think uh, this meeting is benefit for the treaty in the Moscow. I'm sure it's benefit for the treaty in the Mexico. What What do you think uh, this this meeting's significance to yeah. the Cancun meeting? Yes, it's very important and uh, can reach some concurrence. So it's very important and benefit for the treaty in the end of this year. Thank you for your perspective. You are watching Green Voices. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Green Voices. Energy conservation and environment protection also needs our efforts. And it's easier than you may think. Green Voices shows you how. As our living standard improved, buying new clothes is not a luxury anymore. That is to say, there are always some unnecessary clothes in more and more people's closets. The clothes don't pollute themselves, but they consume a great amount of energy resources in the process of producing, processing and transportation. Meanwhile, it generates pollutants such as waste gas and waste water and so on. Some experts estimate that if someone bought one less piece of clothes each year, that means he or she saved 2.5 kilograms of standard coal, which is the 6.4 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions avoided. In terms of Chinese population, if one out of 50 Chinese did this way, 62.5 thousand tons of standard coal would be saved and 160 thousand carbon dioxide emissions were reduced. Not many people change their household bed sheets on a daily basis. When you stay in a hotel, don't ask them to change your bed sheet every day because it costs 0.03 kilowatt hour of electricity, 13 liters of water, and 22.5 grams of washing powder, produces 50 grams of carbon dioxide emissions altogether. 
According to a rough estimation, there are 9,000 star-rated hotels in China. If they all reach the green hotel room standard, which is to change bed sheets in an average of once every three days, then there will be 160,000 tons of standard coal saved and 40,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions prevented accordingly each year. Doing our part to protect the environment does not mean we have to sacrifice our standard of living, but if we all do a little, we can make a big impact. Green Voices is more. Zhou Shengxian, Minister of Environmental Protection, called for more measures to tackle pollution in the Songhua River while addressing a meeting on water pollution control. During the meeting, Zhou pointed out six specific measurements to ensure the overall management of the pollution in the Songhua River and the harmonious development of the local economic and social environments. The minister urged to complete pollution management on time, tighten gatekeeping against polluting enterprises from entering the river areas, and protect drinking water resources. He also said that the government will reward those efforts in protecting the river and encourage all the concerted efforts in dealing with pollutions. The minister added that the government will also make an overall plan in treating the polluted water in the Songhua River within the framework of 12th five-year plan. A park for butterflies has opened in Rostov-on-Don, Russia. About 200 butterflies from South America, the Philippines and Indonesia have been imported and fluttered through the park for visitors. Russians believe that if a butterfly sits down on your palm, you will be happy for the whole year. It's no wonder the park is already a big hit. The Empire State Building in New York City launched a multimedia sustainability exhibit on July the 26th. The two million U.S. dollar exhibit showcases the building's groundbreaking 20 million dollar energy retrofit project. Visitors are educated on each of the eight major retrofit initiatives being implemented at the Empire State Building. They learn about building-wide renovations, electrical and ventilation system upgrades, and see statistics highlighting the positive effects of the process. The Empire State Building's retrofit, announced in April 2009 with former President Bill Clinton and Mayor Michael Bloomberg, is expected to reduce annual energy use by over 38 percent, energy costs by 4.4 million U.S. dollars, and carbon emissions by 105,000 metric tons over the next 15 years. The project is underway with most activity to be completed by 2012. The 1,454-foot Empire State Building was named America's favorite building in a poll conducted by the American Institute of Architects. The Empire State Building Observatory is one of the world's most beloved attractions and the region's number one tourist destination. According to the Business Daily of Johannesburg, the South African government is to start levy the CO2 emission tax from the private core and the lightweight business core buyers. The representative of the South African government states that the act is to protect the environment and is in favor of the economic sustainable development. The CO2 emission tax depends on the amount of individual core emission from 0.6 percent to 4.1 percent of the total core value. However, the second-hand cars are excluded for now. After three years of silt purging and ecological rehabilitation, the Tianzhi Lake on the top of the Tianshan Mountain in Xinjiang Autonomous Region enlarged 150 meters toward south, and its water area increased 40,000 square meters. A few years ago, the water area of the Tianzhi Lake has severely decreased. Some experts alarmed that at the decreasing pace like this, the Tianzhi Lake will be disappeared from the earth in 80 years if no actions are taken. The Xinjiang government invested 25 million RMB or 3.6 million U.S. dollars in response to preserve, clean up and reconstruct the area, and now it showed prominent effects. Since the summer, water levels in Lake Baikal, the world's deepest and oldest freshwater lake, have dropped by more than one-third and a seven centimeters down compared with last year. According to a report from Natural Resources Ministry of the Russian Federation Wednesday, the ongoing heat is blamed for the drying up of the lake. It estimated that the water injection rate will only be 69 percent of the average rate in previous years. Formed about 25 million years ago, the lake is one of the oldest lakes in the world, containing more than 1,700 types of living organisms. About two-thirds are unique in the area. 
On 30th of July, London has launched a cycle hire scheme to encourage more people cycling around London. Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, arrived at the London Eye on his bicycle to introduce a new cycle to work initiative to Londoners, telling the crowd he wants to make London the greatest big cycling city in the world. According to this plan, a total of 5,000 bikes have been placed at 315 docking stations across central London. People can easily find a bike to rent every 300 meters in central London. And for just one pound, the bikes can be used all day. More than 10,000 people have already signed up online to use the bikes, and more than 6,000 keys were activated on the first day alone. Shipping services and tourism on the Yalu River in Liaoning province have been suspended. More rain is forecast to hit the already swollen waterway, which marks the border with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Thursday, a soldier at a border defense station said water levels had risen almost half a meter over one night. As a result, more than 40,000 residents have been evacuated from their homes in Dandong. Some went to schools on higher ground and others stayed in relatives' homes. Thursday, authorities blocked all the gates on dike walls that separate the riverside from the downtown. Soldiers, civil servants and residents have also been mobilized to fight the floods. Problems are widespread in the area. The Two Men River, also bordering the DPRK, has seen record water levels in the past two weeks. The Yanbyan Korean Autonomous Prefecture, which is nearby, has suffered the worst floods in 100 years. More than 500,000 people have been affected. Torrential rains and floods have destroyed thousands of homes and forced residents to evacuate. According to the state flood control and drought relief headquarters, as of Wednesday, rain triggered floods had left 1,072 people dead nationwide this year. Another 619 are missing. Rain isn't the only weather problem. Some parts of China are dealing with a continuous heat wave. Temperatures in Hunan and Jiangxi provinces are forecast to reach 40 degrees Celsius within the next 24 hours. That's 104 Fahrenheit. It's summer vacation now, and many children are using their time away from school to pick up some practical knowledge. Children are going to summer camps, which are not all about fun and games. Green Voices takes you to a special pet ownership summer camp in Vancouver, Canada. At this SBCA shelter, all the animals here have been donated by people who don't want the animals or confiscated from people who have neglected the animals. At this BC summer camp, it provides an ideal opportunity for the children to get up close to the animals firsthand to learn about their health and welfare. Usually, summer in Canada means fun in the sun, but for a lot of children, it means excitement-filled days at summer camp. From mid-June through August, a five-day session for campers was held in Vancouver. To educate children from 8 to 12 about animal welfare issues of the wild, domestic and farm variety, the campers offered a series of activities during the five days. This summer camp has been operating by the Society for the Prevention and Cruelty to Animals for more than 15 years in Surrey, British Columbia, a city outside Vancouver. I love it here. It's awesome. I'm so glad I'm here right now learning about different animals, dogs, and um, today we're learning about cats. And I uh, love all my friends here, and it's fun. Oh, the kids' camps are very, very important. We work with the children um, for the one week that we're here. They are able to interact first and foremost with the animals. So um, they come down to the shelter to meet the dogs, play with the cats. We're fortunate that we have uh, horses in the barn right now, so they're able to interact with a variety of different animals. That's Green Voices for this week. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Wong. Thanks. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time. I was patrolling the pachinko.
Coming up, green volunteers on campus. Tips for washer use make both clothes and environment clean. How to keep garden lovely and water saving. Find the answer in Los Angeles. Hello and welcome to Green Voices, a weekly program co-produced by the Ministry of Environmental Protection of China and Xinhua News Agency. I'm Xinxuan in Beijing. Today we're glad to have Wang Qian, a current law school student at the University of Michigan, who has a passion for environmental protection. Thank you for being here, Qian. Thank you. I know you're a student at a law school, but I also know that you are also a member of the China Entrepreneur Network, or CN. So can you explain to us what CN is? Sure. Uh, China Entrepreneur Network is a, a student organization formed by the Chinese students at the University of Michigan. And it was founded by uh, several Chinese students of the Ross School of Business. Uh, its goal is to establish a platform for people in both China and the U.S. to explore entrepreneurship. So your main goal is to build businesses while being environmentally friendly. So could you tell us some of the projects you or CEN are working on in the area? Uh, sure. Uh, we have two major uh, environmental projects in China right now. Uh, the first one is the clean water project. Uh, as you may know, uh, lack of clean drinking water is a big problem in many of the rural uh, areas in Midwest China. Uh, and it could lead to uh, many health problems, including GI tract diseases. Uh, after some investigation, we found a filter technology from a Michigan company. Uh, we think the, this technology has great potential in China's rural areas because of its uh, long life cycle, affordability, and uh, its independence of electricity. Uh, therefore, we uh, uh, contact some agencies in China. Once tested, qualified, this technology will be introduced uh, to China as part of China's Rural Area Water Improvement Program. Now, more and more students like you are participating in social activities, especially in environmental conservation. And we also know that there are also some popular environmental organizations in Hong Kong universities like Green World, Green Woods and Green Bird. And Green Voices will take you to Hong Kong, where student volunteers are working together to create a greener planet. Environmental conservation is one of the key issues in the city of Hong Kong. There are groups of green-minded university students staging various activities to deliver a green message to both the campus and the city. This spring, many of them also stood out to join the S Hour. Say, some, ye, young. The 2010 Earth Hour was observed on March the 27th in Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. Most of the landmarks turned off the lights for an hour starting from 8.30 p.m. local time. The activity aims to raise awareness about climate change and the threat from greenhouse gas emissions. It's the second time for Hong Kong to attend this activity. Among the participants were students from 230 schools. A series of activities were organized to promote green lifestyles, including photo exhibitions and candle parties. In the activity called the Bicycle Power Station, people can generate electricity by riding a bike. Young people in Hong Kong use their own ways to bless the planet. <laughs> Cities in 125 countries and regions participated in 2010 Earth Hour. Many landmarks around the world, such as the pyramids in Egypt, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and the Forbidden City in China, all turned off lights during the activity. Well, nearly every university in Hong Kong has its own environmental organization. Well, Chen, as a university student, why is it so important for you to join an environmental conservation course? Uh, like. Many uh, youngsters all around the world, I am very concerned with environmental issues. I think 
A lot of the environmental issues are future concerns for our fathers, but they are becoming uh, real. They are becoming reality for us and our children. Therefore, I feel obliged to act so that environmental protection uh, can become a deeply rooted concept in people's mind and uh, guide our um, uh, life and development in the future. Mm. And meanwhile, as a Chinese student still studying overseas, I was motivated by another concern. I go overseas, not just to go overseas, I go because I want to expand my horizon and explore uh, opportunities from a different angle. Uh, therefore, uh, I hope to keep my uh, connections with China while I study overseas and uh, have an updated uh, understanding of China. And that's why I want to participate in the environmental protection course in China. Mm -hmm. So students around the world are taking action to create a green planet. And Green Voices has more from a student-run initiative in Australia. The university established Sustainable Development Department in 2008. Actually, it was initiated by students themselves. At first, the students organized activities to raise awareness of environmental protection on the campus. Finally, with the support of the school, they set up their own organization to run green activities. I think a lot of it is organized through volunteering. Um, a lot of our students come to us and say they'd really like to learn more mm -hmm. and be involved mm -hmm. and get some experience in what it means to become more sustainable. Um, so we have a number of action groups that our students can get involved in and these are focused on things like energy and water and biodiversity. The students are passionate to do their part in protecting the earth and more and more of them have joined the organization. The students are the voice. Uh, not only are the voice of the university, they're the voice of the future. They will leave this university and become our leaders, our, our policy writers, our professionals. They will be the decision makers of the future. So I would love for all of our students to be really active environmental protectionists. In the United States, environmental organizations are also very popular in universities. The Sierra Student Coalition and the Center for Environmental Citizenship are both popular among student volunteers. Chen, can you tell us more about these organizations in the U.S.? Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, there are quite a few uh, active student environmental groups in the U.S., such as the Sierra Student Coalition you just mentioned. They initiated a nationwide campaign called uh, Campuses Beyond Coal. Uh, so their members uh, petitioned in many universities asking for uh, the kick off of coal from campuses. Recently, the University of North Carolina has agreed to shut down its coal plants by the year uh, 2020. Another example is the, stu the Student Environmental Action Coalition. It calls on college students to pledge to make clean, just energy as their top priority in their vote in the election. In this way, this group is trying to influence policy making by influencing young voters. Mm -hmm. The Sierra Student Coalition operates more than 100 branches of its organization in the U.S. alone and has more than 24,000 registered members. So can you tell us how this kind of coalition or association or organization can remain effective while as it grows in popularity? Uh, I think they are very good at using the Internet to keep their members together. On the one hand, they have well-designed and well-maintained websites. And uh, on the other hand, they use email groups and uh, electronic newsletters to keep their members updated with their uh, activities. Uh, they also uh, use social network websites and uh, Twitter to uh, organize campaigns. 
China is also home to many environmental protection organizations, and students are also a major contributor to their success. Green Voices has more. A group of Chinese college students are doing their best to attract public attention on the protection of the Pushwaski Gazelle. They brought their message to the streets in Xining, capital of northwest China's Qinghai Province. It is the seventh consecutive year that they did this. We hope the public can know better about Przewalski's gazelle through the pictures and leaflets prepared by us. The Przewalski's gazelle is not the same as Mongolian gazelle or the Tibetan antelope, but they are also endangered. People should give them more attention and protection. Braving summer heat. Fourteen college students have traveled 1,900 kilometers on their bikes across China in 30 days. Wearing T-shirts with words reading "Everyone should do waste sorting," the students hope their trip can help with environmental protection. They came to Nanchang, capital city of East China's Jiangxi Province, in early August. We want to show our determination to protect the environment through this activity. We also hope to raise the public awareness of waste sorting by this trip. In addition, students in Beijing colleges are expanding their green efforts into policy making. In Peking University, students have formed a research group devoted to environmental protection policies, combining passion and their knowledge. My major is environmental economics and policy. I hope to put what I have learned from classes into actual use. In the neighboring Tsinghua University, a student group, the Green Association, has crossed borders in environmental protection. The Green Association is having close cooperation with a number of foreign environmental protection groups, including the International Youth Conference on Climate Change. The association has also organized activities to encourage paper recycling and tree planting. I hope more and more volunteers can join us to protect the environment. We should start from the little things to keep the earth clean. We also hope to have more cooperation with our groups. To protect the environment needs the efforts of all. Chen, is there any difficulties you or your organization encountered? Uh, well, fortunately, we haven't encountered major. Difficulties, but like many other environmental groups,、uh, funding is a big issue、uh, for us. Uh, I think uh, the biggest、uh, cost comes from the field trips、uh, for the, of those、uh, social business、uh, projects.、Uh, our way, our solution is to have those field trips as the summer internships for our members. And in many、uh, universities, you can apply for fellowships to sponsor、uh, such summer internships, and、uh, that's what we have done to、uh, solve the funding issue.、Mm -hmm. So, what do you think can these university-based organizations do to become more effective?、Uh, I, from my experience, I think the biggest challenge、uh, most student universe,、uh, most student organizations. Face is the mobility of its members. For example, you may have a very strong leadership this year. They are capable. They are devoted, and your organization is、uh, well run. But next year they graduate, and the group may collapse.、Uh, I, I, my suggestion is that、uh, the group can have some.、Um, Professors or、uh, alumni as their consultants, and also they should try to keep track of the graduated members. In this way, the continuity of the group is、uh, maintained, and also you can, it can help connect your group with the society gradually, and so that your、uh, group is not limited to campuses only. You're watching Green Voices. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Bulgarians are trying to preserve the beauty of their country's famous seven lakes of the Rila Mountains. How will they achieve this goal?
by collecting garbage left by tourists and limiting the number of visitors. The Seven Lakes are a chain of lakes that lie over 2,000 meters above the sea level in the Rila National Park, which is 90 kilometers south of the Bulgarian capital Sofia. The lakes have a glacial origin, and their shores are covered by snow drifts even in late summer. All the lakes are connected by small streams and waterfalls, and each lake is named according to its most distinct feature. For example, the highest one is called the Sozata or the Tear, due to its clear water. The stunning scenery has drawn flocks of both domestic and foreign tourists. Despite helping boost local business and tourism, the tourists also make the region a bit overcrowded and leave too much garbage behind. To preserve the beauty of the lakes, Bulgarian activists are trying their best. In the last week of August, more than 50 volunteers collected a total of three tons of garbage left by tourists around the lakes. The activity was organized by the Environmental Association for the Earth, which is a non-governmental organization in Bulgaria. This is the 11th consecutive year that the group organized volunteers to collect garbage. Chinese embassy staff also participated. In addition, the rapidly increasing number of tourists is also posing threats to the local ecosystem. The activists of Harrington defeat defeating the debate, however, did not stop concerns for the fragile ecosystem. Venia Boneva, a senior member with For the Earth, said that in 2008, about 30,000 people visited the Seven Lakes, but the number was 40,000 in August 2009 alone. I saw happiness on the faces of many tourists, but the ecosystem here is very fragile and cannot put up with so many people every day. In November 2009, the European Commission sent a warning letter to Bulgaria, saying the development of ski infrastructure in the Rila Mountains would have potentially disastrous impact. It also urged the government to forbid logging there. Welcome back. Deserts in Mongolia have continued to grow over the past decade, sparking major concern environmentalists around the world. Experts have been sent to the Asian country as part of an in-depth investigation, with the hope of finding ways to stop the destructive problem. Green Voices has more from Mongolia. Latest research shows as much as 90 percent of the Mongolian territory might become desert in the next few years. Now, over 70 percent of the country is covered by sand. The battle against desertification has been a top concern for Mongolia, where stock grazing is the key industry. Researchers say overgrazing, deforestation, and more droughts are to blame. <laughs> Since 2008, the United Nations, the Mongolian Academy of Sciences, and the Swiss research group have been making an in-depth research to look into how to fight desertification. We have set up an experimental field of 25 hectares to see which plants are good at resisting wind and sand. In Mongolia, ecosystems are especially fragile because of the country's relatively high altitude and continental climate. Many people may say, "How do growing deserts in Mongolia affect me?" In reality, it affects everyone because the change in the ecosystem there ultimately leads to ecosystem and climate changes around the world. Chen, is the situation in Mongolia something your organization is doing? Uh, we we haven't had any specific project for the Mongolian environmental issues, but、uh, our focus has been on. Uh, underdeveloped uh, uh, areas in China, and we hope we could develop a、uh, model、uh, from our work in in China and uh, later uh, transplant it into like other、uh, areas such as Mongolia. And、uh, in addition to that, I think student environmental groups have a lot more to do. The dilemma between environment and、uh, economy that Mongolia is facing actually exists in many other areas in the world, and some other areas may have had this problem like 10 or 20 years ago, but they managed to get out of the dilemma and、uh, adopt sustainable、uh, development. 
and student environmental groups could share these stories with the Mongolian people through uh, exchange, such as exchange programs with the Mongolian uh, university students. And in the meantime, we could also learn of the special needs of the Mongolian people and uh, share their story with the world. The growth of student involvement isn't the only thing making headlines in the world of environmental protection. Green Voices has more. Chinese Minister of Environmental Protection Zhou Shengxian has been awarded Russian Federation President's Award for his contribution to the cooperation between China and Russia in environmental protection. The award was presented to Zhou in Beijing by visiting Russian Minister of Natural Resources and Ecology Yuri Trutenev on behalf of President Dmitry Medvedev on August 30th. The Chinese minister has pledged continued efforts to further improve cooperation between China and Russia in protecting the environment. The two countries have achieved close and comprehensive ties in environmental protection, which have been an important part of the China-Russian strategic coordinating partnership. The UN climate talks will be held in Cancun from November the 29th to December the 10th in a bid to hammer out a binding pact on carbon dioxide emissions to replace the Kyoto Protocol, which expires in December 2012. Mexico has begun to prepare for the key meeting. We believe that we have to restore confidence. Mexico will provide a clean and dedicated meeting environment for the meeting. We are going to visit each country. In the following months, we will talk with environment officials in Africa, Japan and Islamic countries. We hope every part of the world can participate in the meeting in Cancun. The minister also said it is very important for the developed countries to fulfill their commitments so that developing countries could have confidence to make an international agreement. The 2010 International Forum on Biodiversity Conservation Strategy kicked off on September 1 in Chengdu, capital of southwest China's Sichuan province. Li Ganjie, vice minister of the Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection, said that to maintain biodiversity needs concerted efforts of all the countries around the world and all the sectors of society. Li is also the secretary general of the forum in China. The forum this year focused on the strategies and public policies to protect biodiversity in China. It also highlighted the cooperation between China and other countries and regions in this regard. A group of Greenpeace organization members gathered in front of the Mexican Department of Environment Protection on August the 24th. They protested against the Spanish company's construction of the big tourist site. Some environmentalists even dressed as Spanish knights in attendance to compare the Spanish developers' behavior to colonizers' plunder. The Spanish company plans to build a high-end tourist district in a coastal area. The project includes hotels, golf courts, mansions and shopping malls. The whole project covers 3,800 hectares of land. Some environmentalists say the project would destroy local natural resources such as coral reefs. They are appealing to the Mexican government to revoke the construction permit. Chinese icebreaker Snow Dragon sailed for home on August 31st after completing its fourth scientific expedition in the Arctic Ocean. Since its arrival in the Arctic Ocean on July 20th, the Chinese expedition team has completed a comprehensive oceanographic survey of more than 130 marine stations, short-term and long-term ice stations. This has broken many records in the history of China's Arctic expedition and navigation. The arrival point at 88.22 degrees north latitude and 177.2 degrees west longitude marked the farthest north the Chinese researchers have ever been. With the help of ice observations, ice boils, ironborne remote sensing and other technology, the team obtained over 8 million groups of data with respect to aerology, oceanography, hydrology and ecology. Numerous water samples, biological samples, and 192 samples from the ice core with a length of 300 meters were also collected during the expedition. On August 20th, Chinese scientists reached the North Pole, extending their research in the Arctic Ocean to the Earth's northernmost point. 
The scientists carry out a series of research activities at the pole, including collecting sea ice and seawater samples and ecological observation. An exhibition displaying the latest energy-saving tools and technologies kicked off Tuesday in Irwindale, California. But Smart Meter offers more than just monitoring your electricity. It monitors your budget too. Just set a desirable budget for the monthly utility bill. It could remind homeowners when the utility cost is over the budget and calculate the cost of how much it costs to run the appliances. Creating a greener planet can be something we'll all take part in. As a matter of fact, every time you turn on your washing machine, you can actually help save your planet. How? Green Voices explains. You will waste water and electricity if you wash only two or three pieces of clothes by washing machines. Hand washing them can reduce more than 3.6 kilograms of carbon emissions a year. And people often overuse washing powder. Sparing one scoop of washing powder can save energy and cut carbon emission. It is estimated one kilogram of washing powder consumes energy comparable to 0.28 kilograms of coal, which leads to 0.72 kilograms of carbon emissions. If each Chinese family saves one kilogram of washing powder every year, over 100,000 tons of coal can be saved and 280,000 tons of carbon emission reduced. Meanwhile, there are about 190 million washing machines in China. Many of them are outdated models that are not energy or water efficient. Authorities and environmental activists are encouraging people to switch to energy-saving washing machines. Compared with old models, these washing machines can save almost half of the electricity and water. Such a machine can save energy comparable to 3.7 kilograms of coal and slash over 9 kilograms of carbon emission per year. More families are expected to choose energy-saving washing machines since they also keep down the electricity and water bill. The reward for protecting and healing our planet is a beautiful, healthier place for all of us to live in. The perfect example of what we can achieve can be found in a neighborhood in Los Angeles, where the people have taken ownership of a local garden and turned it into the best in town. I'm right here in front of a residential garden, and as you can see, this garden right here uses a lot of California native plants. And compared to normal gardens, which requires a lot of water and energy, this one actually saves water. And why is that? Let's find out. The garden boasts more than 40 drought-resisting desert plants, defeating all of its neighboring counterparts, and was crowned the best garden. And much to the owner's delight, the family's water bill was also greatly reduced since they redesigned the garden last October. Many of these plants have not been watered since it last rained, and we remember when that was. That was way back when in April. So many of the plants are natives, so they're used to the California climate. They don't want to be watered during the summer. The winter rains are fine. A few plants are not native, so what I do is I keep an eye on them and I come out with a sprinkling can and water them individually if they look like they need just a little bit of perking up. As Southern California is always short of water and Los Angeles is facing serious drought problems, many people consider this drought-resisting garden design as the best way to save water and energy. That's Green Voices for this week, and thank you for being here, Chen. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching this edition of Green Voices. We、we'll、see you again next week. I was patrolling the pachinko.